Welcome to the Parkland Report. My name is Seamus Riley. Joining me on this program, Dr. Tom Ramage, President of Parkland College. <laughs> and so first, let's all uh, start off talking about the, um, all of the construction that has gone on and has largely completed some of the backfill process. It's been an incredibly interesting time. Fantastic to see the finished product. I'm very glad that there are no more construction trailers, tractors, fences of any of that sort uh, or kind on campus anymore. So you're right, all the, all the new buildings are done. Um, all the major outside work has been completed. Um, little projects here and there are still going on. I think we're doing some staining of the uh, exterior woodwork and uh, certainly landscape stuff is still happening. But all the work's now moved inside. So we built uh, five or six new buildings. Uh, the people who are designed to occupy those buildings have done so and the spaces that they have vacated uh, have gone through a process by which we reallocate those spaces to uh, uh, projects, programs, and needs uh, based on their ranked order that's uh, determined by a college committee. So that has been done and we're renovating uh, and reallocating that space and that will go on for probably another three years or so before we're finished. So in the student union, which is sort of like right. the Parkland's front door, which we talked about, um, and there was a lot of thought went into the planning of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, recently retired Dr. Linda Moore, Vice President for Student Services, spent a lot of time in thinking about what pieces needed to go in and in what right. order. Right. Now that they're in there, it just seems like it's always been there in a natural sort of process for having all those pieces together. Well, for half of our, half or more of our student population, it has always been there, but they don't know anything different. Sure. Uh, they don't know the old days where we had a cafeteria that sat about 80 students versus 350 that we have now, or that all the, uh, the various student services that they need to get uh, started in a class or re-enrolled or change their major or uh, talk to their financial aid uh, folks or a counselor, they're all right there on the second floor of the Student Services Center. So from a, a student perspective, it's all very seamless and uh, I think it works pretty well. Well, one of the things from our point of view is we get to see students sort of amalgamated in groups and sort right. of study sessions and working mm -hmm. together. Um, it's very comfortable space. It's very bright space. Uh, it seems to, you know, convey like that they seem really happy to have that nice bright space. Well, modern, update, bright, lots of windows, um, lots of uh, friends around, uh, fairly good food service, knock on wood. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a nice place to be. And it has helped us in sort of um, some of our objectives in terms of like enrollment, for example, or you know, making sure students are ready when they come in here. You know, we have some on-time you know right. uh, enrollment processes now and registration, making sure that it's very seamless. That seems to have helped with those processes as well. I think so. It's a little easier um, to understand that all your all your needs can be met, or most of your needs can be met. Um, in that one facility, it's easy to find. Uh, again, it's the front door. Um, students who um, this is their first time on campus. It's a clear indicator that this is the place you start. I want to mention one addition to the addition, and that is we sort of expanded our bookstore right. in a way that I think is extremely interesting mm -hmm. and creative, and that is the addition of some uh, computer and computer supplies and tablets available for right. students and packaging in a way that's kind of unique a little bit. Right, certainly unique to Parkland. Um, we weren't in the building for more than a year and we already had to expand the bookstore and you're absolutely right we've made the decision uh, to start selling Dell computers at a, at a pretty nice discount um, for both students and faculty uh, and the, certainly the community uh, but we we thought we'd sell you know maybe a dozen or so this first semester and last I heard we were at uh, I think 101 uh, computers sold so students find value in it uh, it's a, a, a very convenient way to acquire a piece of technology that I think is absolutely required for anybody who's entering higher education these days. If you don't have your own device um, of some sort, whether it's a full-size PC or a laptop or a tablet even, mm -hmm. uh, I think you're at a disadvantage. So making it convenient for our students is uh, was a priority. Well, a significant discount on the actual piece of hardware, but also right. some additional benefits for the software packages sure. which are provided, which is a great boon to the students. Right. Well, all, all students uh, now, upon enrolling you even one, in one credit hour, uh, get the uh, Microsoft Office suite uh, for free. Uh, that's Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Access, and Excel. 
um, and Outlook uh, for their Mac or their laptop or their uh, PC as well as their phone or tablet, uh, whichever variety they have. I think there's 15 total licenses uh, that come with that in various uh, different flavors. So on the technology theme mm -hmm. and maybe changes in infrastructure which are not immediately visible to somebody walking in from outside, but we've made some pretty significant changes in our own infrastructure in terms of our internal communication for faculty and staff and our email system, for sure. example. Sure, absolutely. We changed over from a, um, a system that we had for multiple decades. I can't tell you exactly how long it was, but uh, quite a while to um, uh, an industry standard, a Microsoft Exchange uh, back end with a Outlook or a variety of other front ends that allow people, students, faculty, staff more flexibility in terms of how they deal with email. And I think it's been pretty well received. We haven't rolled out the student side quite yet, but that's, I think, coming over the, uh, the mm -hmm. holiday break here. So when students return in the spring, they'll have one password uh, for their email, their uh, student accounts, anything that uh, has to do with registration, billing, financial aid, as well as any course passwords for any online courses or course management systems that are used. One password, one email system, uh, which is new for this, this institution. And of course, increasingly, software and how it's used and multiple platforms across the campus, I mean, that's an ongoing and changing environment. And, and we've done a, a lot in the last year uh, with the hiring of a new chief information officer and, and really helping to sort of solidify some of those platforms and take us to the next level. Right, there. right. So we spent quite a bit of time uh, last year working on a technology master plan, identifying the areas that needed uh, attention uh, the most from disaster recovery to how we're going to deploy our uh, student and financial and human resources systems as well as the uh, the instructional systems and one of the well the leading outcome of that uh, uh, master plan was to hire a professional chief information officer which we've done and I think the the progress that we've we've made as an institution since uh, Amin Kassem has come on has been phenomenal we've we've uh, clarified our direction, we've um, structured our approach to developing new systems and adding new software into the works uh, in a way that I think makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, our campus technologies department has done fabulous work for decades, mm -hmm. but uh, <clears throat> uh, you know this, this sort of uh, visionary leadership in terms of where we want to go relative to technology has benefited us greatly. We also have a, a stop-in service where, where faculty right. and staff and students can go in and right. get some help on their technology So needs. a help desk, yeah, right yeah. across the uh, hall from uh, what will be public safety as soon as they get moved in in about four weeks. Uh, Walk-in service, uh, phone, email, uh, if you're having trouble with your device, uh, a, a web service that we have or, or uh, other uh, technology-based service, they can help you there. There's a, a ticketing process that walks you all the way through resolving your problem. So. Well, we're keeping pace with how people are dealing with technology. I mean, we, we're now somewhere used to and right. you know getting a phone delivered and just hooking it up yourself, which you never Absolutely. could do before. So, well, we're we're an Amazon culture. Yes, We'd like to uh, <laughs> click on something, uh, automatically order it, and have it at your doorstep two days later or or less, I suppose. Now, yes, that's incredible. Uh, and we should have our, our course registration process work sort of like that. Yes. Well, we're hoping to be able to do that soon. I think you are. Um, let's talk a little bit about our students and our student population. It's no secret that they've been declining in moments in the state and right. across the country, which typically will happen in, in, as the economy mm -hmm. moves. Um, we seem to be on the right trajectory now in terms of our student enrollment this semester. It seems to be. Uh, we are leveled out, down a little bit this semester, about 3% three, 3 or so. Uh, but that comes off uh, about four years, maybe three and a half years of uh, pretty steady decline in our student population. And as you mentioned, that's a national trend. Uh, community colleges across the country and I, I would think a good number of universities as well certainly in Illinois it's true uh, have seen declining in uh, enrollment in their freshman classes um, for us for the community college world uh, we generally tie that to the economy as things uh, improve economically our enrollment tends to trail off uh, when we see uh, recessions or bumps in the uh, economy our, our enrollment picks up uh, back in 2007 or so, we saw about a 25 percent increase. That's bled off a bit over the years, but we're still uh, doing fairly well. And if the trend continues, if history is uh, uh, any, uh, any guide, uh, we'll start that slow, steady increase again like uh, we've seen in, in past years. 
Parkland's always been in the sort of uh, the front line of new advancing technologies and new career programs and mm -hmm. technical programs and you know students are attracted to the quality of the programs and the quality of the instruction we have here. Um, a couple of technological sort of advancements in like the anatomage table for mm -hmm. example and some of the other technology really has added to the you know the experience for the student coming into these sure. programs. Sure, sure and there's multiple benefits. You mentioned the anatomage table, which our anatomy and physiology uh, courses use, and there's, uh, I can't remember the number, but lots of sections of anatomy and physiology that are taught here every year. Um, <clears throat> anatomy and physiology relies on a cadaver lab, so we have um, some number of cadavers on campus that are uh, expensive to maintain, expensive to acquire, expensive to prepare, uh, and an anatomage table lets us substitute in ways that make sense, uh, faculty driven ways, to minimize our use of cadavers. Uh, it's a simpler process with a better fidelity um, model, let's mm -hmm. call it. So cadavers wear down over time after sure. use, uh, but you've always got this pristine model on a, on a large iPad, for lack of a better word, uh, that students can manipulate very, very uh, easily and very um, um, uh, in a way that makes total sense. So 250 or so anatomical models that you know you can strip down to the bone system or the circulatory system or do a virtual operation with your finger uh, all in five minutes. I remember seeing a decade ago this idea, this notion of a flat top sort of right. interactive computer system and I remember thinking, wow, that's, that's fantastic, but I can't see it happening. But we're already, we've got two examples, one in, in, in the uh, physical geography space where we're using the same technology and it really is incredible to think what, what might be along the... Absolutely, you know, and, and I did, wasn't even aware of some of these pieces that we had on campus till the uh, the festival came up uh, that focused a bit on uh, Pygmalion. Big tech, yeah, right, sure. Uh, the, where we highlighted some of that uh, interesting technology on campus. So I was as ma amazed as uh, some others to see some of that technology, but very cool. Yeah, we'll be right back after a short break. And so this is Victor, and what this is, they've taken CT scans of the human body and they've digitized those. So not only do we have a full-size human, but it also is maneuverable. So we can rotate it and we can also do sections through it. So I can come in and with a slider, I can go from the outside down through different levels. So we can take the students from the superficial down through the deep and they can see different orientations and different relationships between organs that they can't see on the cadavers because we can't go straight down through. The other thing we can do if we're teaching a particular organ system, for example, cardiovascular system, I can turn that on and then everything else is gone except the cardiovascular system. So this really helps us because on the cadavers there are other organs and other tissues in the way and with this we can get rid of everything except just the heart and the blood vessels. One of the problems we have on the cadavers is when the students look where the heart is they can't see the aorta that runs behind it. On this we can rotate the body so they can see the aortic arch, they can see the descending aorta and then they can also see all the different arteries and veins. They get a better idea about that continuity within the system. This reality sandbox allows us to model uh, geologic processes and landforms in three dimension. So in geology, um, we're, we look at um, topographic maps and um, the students do a lab on topographic maps and we try to help them learn to read and interpret those. Those topographic maps have um, detail about towns and cities and roads, but they also have a second dimension, and that is contour lines, lines of equal elevation um, that are on the map, uh, that if you follow that line all the way around, you know that that area uh, has the same elevation along that line. Sometimes it's difficult for the students to understand what that means when you're looking at that 2D map, but if we were to project those same lines onto this um, 3D visualization uh, equipment, you can see that um, we have a hill in the middle, we have another hill over here, we have lower elevations, all of which have those contour lines.
flying has always been on the family list. We've, we've always looked at it. We've, for many years, we've always looked at, you know, what plane should we get as a family? But actually having the training has been in doubt because of the U of I cancellation of the program, and we're really excited to see that Parkland picked it up and makes it more available to me, too. It's different. I have to make sure I catch everything, don't miss anything. Mandy usually backs me up. Just If I miss something little, she'll catch it, but it just I got every little thing, making sure I did it right. A little bit nervous, wasn't sure what the landing was going to be like without someone to correct if I messed up, but it's exciting. Out here since the end of August, actually getting the training. I did my internship here in the spring, so I got a few flights before that. And then it's just been flying with Mandy for those previous 24 hours, just getting ready to do everything, practicing touch and goes. So was, then she put me up in the 80s for the number of landings. And then the rest of the practice is going around doing maneuvers, stalls, slow flight, turns. My mom's parents live overseas, so we traveled over to see them. So we've been on a lot of big planes, and then I figured that'd be something fun to do. And my dad has lots of model aircraft, so we fly those too. So I started on that, and then I guess I worked my way up. It's, it's a good day to see that he's succeeding in something that's ahead of his dad. And knowing that in a couple of years, he'll be my instructor for when I get to go up and do this. Welcome back to the Parkland Report. With me is Dr. Tom Ramage, President of Parkland College. We talked about the uh, technology, mm -hmm. on, the, on the use of technology, both for their faculty and staff and our students. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of our sort of outstanding programs and a newer program to Parkland College at the Institute of Aviation and our aviation program. Talk a little bit about the progress that we're making there. Sure. Well, we're in our second year of operation, just beginning our second year. Uh, and a program that we acquired from the Institute, I'm sorry, from the University of Illinois. Uh, they've operated the Institute for Aviation since 1946. And uh, we have been in it for about a year now and uh, have about 30, 35 students enrolled in that program, uh, down from its um, historical high of about 200 and some odd students when the university was in sort of full operation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're growing the program. Word was that uh, in the aviation community that that program had shut down. So we have to do a lot of marketing, a lot of changing that message to let folks know that uh, Parkland still has that program. It's the same faculty, the same aircraft, the same curriculum uh, that it was when the university operated it. Uh, the good news is that it's a little bit more cost effective for our students these days. Mm -hmm. So Parkland tuition uh, rates are a, a little bit more affordable than the universities. Uh, and we've reduced some of the uh, flight fees, which are very expensive, mm -hmm. uh, that are associated with that program, and created a, sort of a niche uh, for uh, both private pilots and those that would like to be commercial pilots, in that you can uh, get an associate's degree at Parkland College, all your certifications that lead to, toward uh, the commercial pilot license, uh, in about two and a half to three years, uh, at, at a pretty good price point. And the advantage there is that students uh, have uh, the opportunity to get more hours in the air than they would in the previous model, which makes them employable uh, a whole bunch faster, uh, a little bit more attractive to the airlines because a student can have more, more mm -hmm. uh, uh, flight hours. Uh, and, and an interesting model. I think we're probably one of the first in the country to, to look at that sort of um, mixing of uh, uh, an associate degree in, in, a, in a flight training program. So one of the strengths of the program, of course, is the quality of the instructors and the, the long history that the Institute has had, right. and a real need in the airline industry for more pilots. I mean, this is, right. this is a huge need that we have. I saw a, a Wall Street uh, Journal article f fairly recently, maybe a month or so ago, predicting uh, a, a significant pilot shortage, not only in the United States, but in um, places like China and Indonesia and in India that are developing their airline infrastructure sure. at, a, at a huge pace. There's some hundred thousand pilots that are going to be needed in China alone in the next year. Uh, and there's uh, certainly not the capacity to train that volume of students in China. And that's one of the areas that we're looking at is uh, developing a relationship with an, an airline in China to do some training for uh, those students. And that's not too far away. Uh, hopefully within a couple of months we'll have 
uh, a signed contract there and uh, be a, a dual, uh, well, certainly an international program. Sure, excellent. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that have gone on in terms of, uh, as we change our physical appearance, we've also made some changes in our branding and looking I, a bit at, at sort of how we market ourselves. I know this certainly plays into the uh, Institute of Aviation in terms of recruitment there. That's a pretty exciting, more modern feel to the uh, positive branding. Right, I think so. I, we're certainly not uh, abandoning our old logo, sure. uh, or our, that's not old, our, our historical logo and look and feel, but yeah, every once in a while it's good to update and refresh, and our marketing and public relations folks have uh, come up with a, uh, an exciting new branding opportunity. Uh, I, it should be uh, widely dispersed at the college and very short order. I've seen a couple of uh, TV spots that are ready to go. Maybe some billboards have been up around campus uh, or around the, the uh, community already. And I think we have a, uh, one of our racing trailers uh, mm -hmm. already wrapped in yeah. this new branding model. Uh, good good uh, feedback from faculty, staff, community uh, who have seen it so far. It's simple, it's easy to remember, and it, uh, I think it represents Parkland very well. So, you know, the go-ahead model and sort of substitute then what matches whatever the program is I, or whatever the student need is. And a lot of really great photographs of our students in action and absolutely. working on, on the things. And, you know, one of the things that Parkland... And real students, not... Yeah, not, uh, not Staged or what are they? What Stock are they called? Stock yeah, no, we got, <laughs> There are actual okay. students. We we recognize them, which of course is part of what the long tradition at, at Parkland has been always. Uh, not only that we have our students, but our these are this is our community. Absolutely. And the folks who come here as students then end up oftentimes becoming staff and faculty, and it's absolutely a testament to what we do. Well, the the marketing company that we've worked with, uh, the the head of that company is a Parkland graduate from our graphic design program and I think that's an excellent way to do a new branding campaign is to work with your graduates who are in the business and are, are feel a, a dedication and a loyalty to Parkland College. Sure and I think that's absolutely true. How about talk a little bit as well about some of the uh, creative things that we've been doing here. We've always been self-starters and sort of in the sort of the the front line of new ideas and so we have an ideas process here we encourage our faculty and staff to be creative about things we certainly have been lucky in, in some of the things that have kind of surfaced and have been started off and right. employed here right so that this is an idea that's maybe a two and a half two two or so years old where we've identified some resources dollars uh, to support projects ideas um, concepts that um, a faculty member, a staff member, an administrator might have that don't exist yet, but have uh, a great possibility of advancing our uh, progress toward our mission, our goals of recruitment, uh, retention, persistence, and completion aligned with our strategic plan. So we've gone through a couple of cycles where we've taken basically applications. What's your idea? Uh, how will it advance the institution? What sort of dollars do you need uh, to make that happen? And we've got some great successes out of it. We've got a Parkland academic team that's won some national awards in how we support uh, Latino students in particular. We've put uh, solar panels on top of the building to help support uh, not only a program but reduce our reliance on uh, traditional energy sources. Um, there's probably four or five more that we can talk about. I know October uh, is the deadline for mm -hmm. this year's project, so I'm, I'm looking, at, uh, looking forward to seeing what comes out of our uh, faculty heads uh, this go-around. Great projects. But it sort of matches sort of like the progression, you know, advancing sort of some of these ideas and concepts and marrying together the, the physical space with new ideas. And Certainly. Keeping that strength of community mm -hmm. and fostering that connection between faculty and staff across uh, disciplines across departments. Exactly, and that's that's one of the requirements of the uh, uh, the, the application is how does this um, not only advance the uh, strategic plan, but how are you collaborating with other departments, other areas? This this should be a cross uh, departmental uh, impact. Of course, the sign of growth and progress in a community college or any college or organization is that you change from time to time. Certainly. So we're in the process of sort of doing some reorganization across mm -hmm. academic mm -hmm. lines, rethinking some of those pieces. Right. That's largely in play now. It's, it's been a pretty interesting right. yeah, uh, the, development. The heavy lifting is done. Uh, we've moved from a, a department model where we had nine academic departments to a division model where uh, it's not, certainly not new to Parkland, but in the last 20 years or so, we've been organized this, this departmental way. So we have uh, an uh, arts and sciences division. We have a career and tech ed division 
health professions, and then uh, learning support, um, each with a dean. Uh, those deans have been named and they are in place. Uh, and they're in the process this semester, this year, actually, of uh, creating the structure uh, by which those divisions intend to operate uh, going forward. So it's a, it's a bit of a change. Uh, it's a little less flat than we have been in the past, but uh, given the size of the organization, uh, I think it was a, a change that was certainly needed. I think we're already seeing the benefits. Um, even though we're not totally done with that organizational process yet, we're already seeing the benefits of, uh, uh, of the new organization. You know, um, a lot has changed in the country uh, mm -hmm. with regard to national sort of pictures and positions on education. A lot of conversation about it. Obviously, a lot of issues about funding. Um, our core pieces are solid in terms of what our right. mission is. Even as we begin to modify and change and react to different things, we seem to have a really good product. Right. Well, and that begins with the support of the community, certainly. Um, I, I've said many times that I've worked at Parkland for a long time, for 18 years or so, and it wasn't until I um, started spending more time in the community as, as, the, as president that I understood the, the regard that this community has for Parkland College. Um, there, you, you would be hard-pressed to find a family in the 12-county area that hasn't been touched in some way by this institution, whether a family member has come here or uh, they've seen a, a show in the planetarium or the theater or come to the art gallery uh, or earned a degree. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fabulous. That has to underlie everything. Um, and then certainly the, the, the major parts of our, our revenue stream come from student tuition and, and tax support, which again is community-based. So if a student who is from Belleville, Illinois or Chicago or uh, you know, a community that isn't in our district has heard of Parkland College and decides to come here because of uh, quality or um, uh, uh, the reputation from uh, somebody else who's gone here before and recommended the institu institute, our ties with the U of I and the seamless transfer of credits, all that is a, a gigantic benefit um, for Parkland College. Not that other colleges don't have sure. similar situations, but um, we've got a 46, I'm sorry, 48 year reputation of doing it right and doing it well. We also have made some significant changes in terms of the interactions with uh, high schools and secondary schools and um, we've always worked well with our secondary mm -hmm. uh, partners but we have uh, education for employment for example right. which is now here on campus very mm -hmm. visible and a tremendous and continuing growth in dual credit. Right, it's natural growth of dual credit. We've had um, dual credit, oppor credit opportunities with all 29 of our area high schools for quite a while now and, and it's still seeing um, fairly significant growth semester after semester, but what was missing was that technical component. It's very easy to do a dual credit when you're in the high school, mm -hmm. uh, those uh, transfer level courses. When you start talking about welding or automotive technology or industrial maintenance, uh, things that require very expensive uh, access to uh, specialized equipment or tooling, uh, then the situation changes a bit. We have that investment here at Parkland. Uh, and this is actually the first semester where, where we've created a, a, a new partnership with a dozen or so of those area high schools to bring students here in the morning and give them access to those technical programs in a dual credit fashion um, at a reduced rate uh, in cooperation with the high schools who have to work out transportation issues and scheduling issues. So far, so good. About 100 students this semester have taken advantage of that uh, new relationship, and I only see it growing as we add more schools in and more programs and more opportunities. Well, it certainly seems like an exciting uh, path ahead for, for that aspect of our, our relationship, but also for the, for the college in general. Thank you so much for being here. Always a pleasure, Shane. All right. That's it for this edition of Parkland Report. We'll see you back here next time. Wow.